So in, uh, in response to Preeti's joke, I'm now thinking maybe I should have considered a uh, biostatistician career because my first name sounds almost like P-Val, P-Val in your slides, and then Aronoff, it's pretty close to ANOVA analysis of variance, so that's maybe a loss for, for bias, a good biostatistician, but I didn't do much statistics for, for this talk, so please don't ask any statistics questions. I'm an analytical chemist. I welcome all questions about chromatography and mass spectrometry. Uh, I know that we're a little bit behind our schedule. Uh, I'd like to inform you that I'm very motivated to be on track because I have my outbound flight at 2 p.m. <laughs> so I'll probably be out of here after this uh, talk. Uh, so I'll be speaking today about uh, collaboration I was uh, doing with the Stanford nephrologist uh, Tim Meyer while I was working at uh, Stanford University Mass Spectrometry Lab as a staff scientist and uh, later on then I moved to uh, Therma uh, Scientific about a year ago where I took a position of uh, application chemist and uh, uh, demo chemist in uh, uh, metabolomics. So the, the overview. Uh, the kidney failure uh, leads to uh, a condition called uremia. So basically, when kidney fails, certain chemicals start to accumulate in blood, and uh, uh, those chemicals, they're collectively known as uh, uremic solutes. So with the onset of uremia, the, the usual treatment is to put people on hemodialysis. Uh, currently, in the United States only, there are about half a million people on hemodialysis. You can imagine worldwide, there are much more people. but uh, not everybody responds uh, well to, to this treatment. Uh, some subpopulations of uh, uh, patients, they, they still experience uh, poor quality of life, they experience fatigue, poor appetite, poor sleep. So with uh, average life expectancy of about four years, uh, we just you know keep them on a uh, uh, clutch into their life on the, on the brink of death, but uh, we are just not helping them a lot. So the, the question of this uh, research project is really to identify what are the uh, uremic uh, solutes that accumulate in blood and also what is the difference in concentration between healthy subjects and uh, 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 uremic patients. And when I started this project, I was really surprised how little we know about uh, uremic solids. So here you can see a reference to a review paper published back in uh, uh, 2012. And we can see that there are only uh, 21 compounds with known ratio of about 10 between uh, healthy people and uremic subjects. And the, the, uh, the reason for that is was, uh, all this discovery was done by classical analytical chemistry. It was a very painstaking process to discover one compound after another. So it's really a problem where uh, metabolomics can shine uh, well because we, we do have technology now that can analyze a wide array of uh, mm, metabolites. But uh, in addition, unlike uh, Mo uh, usual metabolomic experiment where you get used to, right, we look for some biomarkers. Those biomarkers usually diagnostic markers for certain disease, but not necessarily causative factors for disease. While in uh, uh, uremia, those uh, compounds that accumulate in blood, they likely cause this disease. So it's not just the opportunity to uh, develop new uh, diagnostics for uremia, but also develop new treatment maybe by making better dialysis machines or changing diets in these uh, subjects. So I start with, uh, with a pilot study we do with team uh, looking at uremic solutes that accumulate uh, with, of uh, microbial origin that accumulate in uh, uh, uremic patients. And this study is based on uh, about century-old hypothesis that actually uh, mi microbes that live in our guts, they slowly poison us. And we, uh, the, the inventor of the dialysis machine actually was supporting this hypothesis. And we also have some sub evidences that this is true, right? We know that there are some enzymes that cleave aromatic amino acids, uh, tryptophan and tyrosine into uh, uh, these uh, heterocycles, uh, indoxyl and cresol that are toxic and they are well-known uremic solids. So how did we approach this problem? And as uh, somebody asked a question to uh, Peter Carperland today, we know that uh, in, in fact, our metabolome is a combination of uh, human metabolites and bacterial metabolites. We have more uh, bacterial cells dwelling in our bodies than actually eukaryotic cells. So how do we uh, separate uh, metabolites of bacterial origin and uh, microbial origin? So 
one approach that you can use, and that's a nice thing working with the clinical researchers, is that you know if you get uh, access to uh, to samples of patients who, who lost their colons in surgery, usually it was done uh, as a treatment for, for colon cancer. They, they don't have colons anymore, so they don't have an environment for those uh, bacteria to, to dwell. So basically, they produce only uh, human metabolites. And then it's a very simple math, right? So we look at uh, healthy subjects. Uh, we look at uh, subjects who, who lost their colons. And then we find out what are bacterial metabolites. Now, uh, the trick here is that we look for uh, uremic solvents, and in healthy people, those uremic solvents, they are cleared very quickly by, by the kidney. So to uh, magnify those effects, we actually look at uremic samples, and that's, uh, again, very uh, nice uh, thing of working with not just the basic researcher, but with the clinician, because they have access to all kinds of samples. And in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, with about 10 million people population, uh, we have about a dozen people who are twice as unfortunate, not that they just they lost their kidney function uh, due to certain disease, they also lost their colon. So we got hold of those very uh, precious uh, samples from, from six subjects. And then it was a classical uh, metabolomic experiment where we compared those groups of samples. Uh, it was back in 2009 at uh, Stanford Maspec facility. At that time, we just got a new uh, executive uh, bench top orbit trap instrument, and it was a fairly uh, common uh, metabolomics experiment using reversed phase chromatography, electrospray ionization, and positive and negative mode. And for, for processing, we use uh, CIF uh, software and also did some validation studies with uh, LCUV available at that time. I don't have much time to, to go too much into details. This uh, study was uh, published uh, back in uh, 2011. A few points I'd like to make here. Uh, so we did identify about 50 uh, seven different uh, compounds that really significantly differ between the samples, but we were able to uh, do solid ID, chemical ID for only 14 compounds. And identification here, I mean, not just, you know, getting accurate mass and, you know, blurbing some possible elemental composition and structure. We actually went, purchased different standards for those compounds, run them chromatographically, compared retention time, compared the mass mass spectra, and then that's where we call it identify 14 uh, metabolites. So it, it truly demonstrates current bottleneck in metabolomics. And in the end of my slides, I will show how we approach this uh, uh, challenge. So uh, what really made me a believer in uh, uh, orbit trap technology when I uh, was uh, back at Stanford, first of all, I was curious how well this instrument performs with uh, accurate mass detection. Because back in graduate school, I was working with, uh, with a different type of mass spectrometer. And I know when you run long longitudinal studies, you run the instrument for one or two days, your mass accuracy may just you know, shift over time. So for me, it was a natural experiment to see how stable mass accuracy measurements are. And for that, I use uh, uh, accurate mass for hippuric acid. That's natural metabolites that occurs in uh, both uh, uh, healthy people and uh, uh, uremic patients, and it ionizes in both positive and negative modes. So we did accurate measurements of this of this mass. And what what I really found is that it has very tight uh, standard deviation. Right, we can measure uh, ppm error with uh, 0.3 uh, ppm uh, standard deviation, and this uh, standard deviation persists for uh, one or uh, two days. Another uh, differ differentiation feature of uh, Orbit trap technology is looking at uh, uh, fine isotopic structure. So when you look at uh, uh, isotopes, what you see, you usually you see your main isotope, right? Your M plus one peak, which is one carbon thirteen, right? And you see M plus two, which is two carbons thirteen. But they're always these small guys, and those small guys they are uh, less abundant isotopes, such as, for example, nitrogen fifteen and oxygen eighteen, and they, they have very specific difference from carbon. 13 isotopes listed here in this table. So i just like to demonstrate you an example of one of the uremic toxin, uh, phenyl uh, acetyl glutamine. And here on the upper slide, you can see M plus 1 isotope, right? We, we can measure accurate mass, but it's not, it's not as important that the accurate mass really matches well to, to the model for C13. Uh, what you can actually see here, there is this small little peak here, and this peak is nitrogen 15. So with 100,000 resolution available with Orbitraf, we can baseline separate those uh, 
uh, peaks, and with, uh, say, model 10,000 resolution, it's one blob. So that really shows you what, that you need at least uh, 100,000 resolution to, to have a baseline separation between carbon-13 and uh, nitrogen-15. And it may really help you then you have uh, multiple metal composition because, for example, you may have uh, uh, one to two ppm uh, mass accuracy, but still you may have uh, several candidate formulas. So how you can tell that uh, one of them is true, and here is one of the examples, right? Again, going back to uh, phenyl acetylglutamine, right? We have this model here, and we have another uh, elemental composition that fits very well with acquired mass. So it's 12-12 uh, here, 1217 for correct elemental composition, and 12 for 3. So if in, uh, in the real world, how we can tell the difference between these two, right? But what we can do here is to look at nitrogen-15 isotopes, and you can see that actually acquired spectrum matches really well to, to the abundance of ni nitrogen-15 isotope found in uh, correct elemental composition in the phenyl acetylglutamine, but not in, uh, in the second heat. So that's a uh, uh, very strong confirmation that we got the correct elemental composition. So let me move on to the, the more exciting project. So we've done this, this uh, pilot study, we published it, and then uh, we start looking at uh, uh, protein-bound solids. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, dialysis machines, they don't work as well as uh, uh, natural kidney. Why is that? Because, uh, well, in both dialysis, dialysis machines, they, they work by concentration gradient, right? You have uh, uh, metabolites that are at high concentration in blood, right? And just by dialysis passive transport, those uh, uh, metabolites by gradient of concentration move into uh, dialysis liquid. While in kidney, there is also active transport, right? That's why you don't lose uh, uh, any useful nutrients with, uh, with urine, right? They're being reabsorbed into, back from primary urine into bloodstream, but uh, also there are certain toxins that would be uh, excreted with very fast rate uh, from, uh, uh, from the blood. So uh, most of you are aware that for usually uh, creatinine is used as a, as a reference standard of how uh, fast the clearances, right? Creatinine is a catabolite of uh, phosphocreatine that's uh, uh, and it leashes with uh, relatively uh, uh, same uh, rate uh, from uh, from the muscles. So in this example, you can see well that supposedly this is a creatinine at a high concentration in blood, and it's a very high, in, in very high concentration in urine. Now let's imagine that we we have certain uh, some proteins in uh, in the blood, and those proteins they bind small molecules, right? So look at this example here. So now all uh, small molecules, all metabolites are bound to a protein. We have only one fraction here available, but you still have the same concentration of metabolites in the urine. So it means that uh, uh, in this particular example, it's actually very fast clearance, an indication of active transport, right? So despite the fact that those metabolites are bound to proteins, there's very little free fractions. They're still very actively removed from blood into, into the urine. And that's what we were looking for, right? So we, uh, we took blood, we uh, processed it with a uh, 30 uh, kilodalton filter, uh, ultrafiltration, right, to obtain uh, ultrafiltrate fraction. And then we compared uh, uh, concentration in ultrafiltrate and in the urine to determine uh, which metabolites are extruded with, uh, with ultrafast rate. And also, I didn't show it here, but we also measured the ratio between blood and ultrafiltrate to determine what's the, what's the binding ratio between those uh, compounds. So why we looked into this? So from a uh, Darwinian, Darwinian perspective, there are, we have two hypotheses that would explain uh, the uh, toxic removal effect. First of all, uh, presumably uh, proteins in our blood, they evolved to, to bind the most toxic compounds, right? So you would, you would want uh, evolution to, to be uh, uh, directed towards uh, binding the more toxic compound. And then the second point would be that uh, very likely uh, active transporters also over time evolved to excrete the most toxic compounds because uh, uh, kidney consumes about 10% uh, of uh, all body energy, so it, uh, it must be some really important function uh, active transporters are uh, doing there. And to, to make the story shorter, so that's where experimental design we used for uh, microbial uh, study. 
And in uh, 2011, we did some modifications here. So now instead of looking at just at the blood sample, we looked at uh, uh, four uh, different matrices. We slightly improved our chromatography going to, to a different phase. And at that time, we finally got uh, LTQ orbitrap valves to do some uh, MS-MS experiments in, uh, in the study. And uh, I'd like to, to mention here, it's not a typical metabolomic experiment, right? Because we look at uh, urine, we look at uh, uh, ultrafiltrate, and we also look at, uh, at blood, right? And everybody on the same page, right? If you put all those uh, three types of samples on PCA plot, they will be very different, right? So it's, uh, it's clear that uh, these are very different samples. What we're really looking here is we're looking for uh, similarities between the samples, and particularly at certain ratios in certain ratios between uh, ultrafiltrate and uh, uh, plasma fractions and certain ratios between ultrafiltrate and urine fraction. So this uh, study was published back in 2013. Again, uh, identified solidly uh, 14 features showed here. So on this logarithmic plot, there are all the, all the features found in the study. And uh, we, we marked some of the uh, metabolites. And again, here by identification, we mean that we actually uh, went and ordered uh, chemicals that they think are those metabolites run them on the instrument, get retention times of those uh, chemicals, got a mass-mass spectra, and you know, confirm that this is exactly uh, the compound of interest. And uh, finally, when I moved to uh, uh, Therma, we got access uh, to uh, Q-Exactive, and that's uh, it's really helped us to, to accelerate the discovery because in the past we, we had to do all the mass mass experiments on the uh, orbitrap valves, right? So you have two two different mass spectrometers. You use one for discovery and then another one for mass mass experiments. And sometimes it's not very practical, right? Because orbitrap valves is usually the, used by proteomics people. They're very protective of the time on the instrument. They think I'm going to inject my urine sample to ruin the instrument, and you know they have to clean it for much longer time even though they spray directly into the source so it's a big discussion to actually can contaminate the instrument faster than me with analytical flow like spraying everything over or uh, proteomics people who spray directly into into the source so anyway it was a big uh, help for us to uh, get the MS MS experiments faster but the um, that's the slide that I'm probably the, the most excited for for this study because then uh, Tim brought those samples to me and he said, well, we're going to measure metabolites in, uh, in urine, we're going to measure them in plasma, and going to measure them in ultrafiltrate at the same time. I was like, oh, I have to explain this to a medical doctor, right? Because he doesn't know what a matrix effect is, what ion suppression effect is. So th this data then are never going to work. But it uh, uh, turned out I was quite arrogant analytical chemist. And when we looked at the comparison between uh, uh, Q-Exactive and again Q-Exactive, there is no internal standard. The only thing uh, we used on Q-Exactive was uh, normalization of urine to 24, our production of urine. So it's, it's strictly ratios, right? Uh, at that time, uh, team got a triple quad instrument in his lab. So he did quantitative assay for, for this uh, four uh, known compounds, so very strict. Uh, quantitative approach, internal standard, uh, uh, and and so on. And what what really amazed me here how close these numbers are for uh, for something that's uh, that has no calibration curves, totally like normalization free, and to uh, uh, your uh, sort of gold standard uh, quantitation with with SRMs on the triple quad. So let me finish on with uh, identification that we use. So. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we, we start uh, finding purity for metal composition from uh, accurate mass, right? So that's, that's one of the examples I'm showing here. So say we, uh, we found that accurate mass and fine isotopes such as nitrogen-15 give us uh, this particular LML composition. So now what, what we do, uh, I, I go to, to methylene, right, and I look, uh, I, I don't do a mass MS search because uh, you know, even though methylene has about uh, 10,000 compounds now, not everything is in, uh, in the database. So I found better luck if you go and look for fragments, right? So you don't necessarily find the same compound, but then you find some leads to, uh, to the compound. In this particular example, in this spectrum, there was very strong signal of uh, 130 and 147 ions. And when I did similarity search for those fragments, it turned out that's uh, glutamine fragments. So then it, would, it was clear that this, it is some sort of glutamine conjugate, right? So what we did, we uh, subtracted uh, 
elemental composition of uh, this unknown metabolite subtracted uh, elemental composition of glutamine and we got some uh, acyl structure here that I uh, assumed is some sort of uh, 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 it's a uh, heptanyl moiety and for, for confirmation we can use uh, uh, Mass Frontier software so uh, Mass Frontier software is uh, a tool that you can use for uh, uh, fragmentation uh, studies right you it, it, it won't do a very good job where you have a completely unknown compound but then you have you, you postulate certain structure just want to make sure that uh, it fragments as uh, fragments match to, to structure you propose you can see that yes you, you do find some some fragments of this this acyl chain but the problem with this approach is it's very slow right so I have to go uh, one compound after another manually extract fragments do manual search in methylene then do all this uh, data interpretation by myself and then draw all the structures in uh, in methylene so it was taking days so what's uh, what's coming on next uh, uh, from from Thurman and our uh, good uh, collaborator from HiCam that's uh, uh, a uh, spectral database called MZ Cloud. So I, I mentioned earlier that we um, I, I find a lot of value in uh, in similarity search when you do uh, MS MS fragmentation. And let me uh, dial back a little bit. So uh, a lot of metabolites they're structure related, right? So in uh, in metabolism there are usually very small changes that are being introduced to a molecule. Say it would be hydroxylation, maybe addition of the double bond. So structure does not really change dramatically with, with each step of metabolism. So what would, what may happen here, right? You can see there are uh, three uh, metabolites here and all three of them, they share the same moiety here, right? So what would happen, you would break them it, in uh, a, mass, uh, a mass experiment and this, uh, this fragment would appear in, uh, in the spectrum. Well, what, what you can do with uh, hybrid orbit traps, you can do next step of fragmentation, right? To do fragmentation of the fragments. And that's a better confirmation, right? Because instead of uh, accurate mass for the fragments, you also get uh, uh, a mass a mass spectrum for the fragments. And that, uh, that gives you more confidence of what those uh, uh, structural components are. And really, the the way how we view the development of this software that we're going to to find some sort of atomic structures in the spectrum, not really atomic structure, but for example, heterocycles that are like the smallest unbreakable units in uh, in mass spec, and then we would feed uh, MS and high resolution data into into the software, and then the software would reconstruct structure out of those uh, uh, spectral trees, taking information about uh, uh, reference uh, substructures. So let me uh, close my presentation. So at uh, uh, Therma, we're working to, to bridge a gap between uh, analytical chemists and uh, uh, biologists, medical researchers. I'm not, a, I'm not qualified to give any biological conclusions here because I'm an analytical chemist, but uh, it was a very good example of uh, uh, collaboration between person who knows, or oh, in the very beginning knew very little about mass spec and me being an expert in, uh, in mass spec, but knowing li very little biology or uh, nephrology. So how it all went and uh, uh, when an uh, analytical chemist can fade away, right, when I may have no guilt and, you know, transfer from Stanford to Therma, so I, I don't leave people behind with their problems. So it turned out that uh, uh, the uh, clinical doctors, especially with uh, good epidemiological background, they can do really good work with uh, uh, finding good uh, uh, relevant clinical question because for analytical chemists it's very often right let, let's measure something right like, let's find the difference so they they know exactly what you're going for they can do very good experimental design and they they also uh, uh, do um, uh, well after you know two, two or three years of collaboration a team actually purchased his own triple quad and was doing experiments on his own so that's sort of a proof that uh, in uh, two two or three years any any medical doctor can run a mass spec where it wasn't working so fast and where you really need analytical chemist is with the interpretation of MS MS spectra, right? That's where I still have my uh, job security, but this may change with the uh, introduction of uh, MZ Cloud, that that's our solution to, to this problem. And uh, in the end, let me acknowledge my uh, former colleagues at Stanford and my current col uh, colleagues at uh, uh, Thermo Fisher, as well as, uh, as Robert. So here at the meeting, we have uh, two of my colleagues, uh, 
Terry uh, Christensen. She, she's here and she's, uh, uh, she's an expert in uh, ion chromatography. That's a very uh, unique way to, to separate uh, uh, polar compounds. So if you have any questions about this unique separation technique, please ask her. And uh, Bob Swaim, he's uh, our expert in mass spectrometry. So after I run away to my flight, please uh, uh, approach him and ask him questions about uh, uh, orbit trap uh, technology. He'll be glad to give you the, the answers. And uh, last and not the least, if you're close to the Boston area on April 11th, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a symposium that will be a day of, of talks by, by Thurman in introducing uh, our solutions to uh, metabolomics and lipidomics. So please uh, uh, talk to, to Bob and get uh, registration information from him. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome questions if you have time.